Hello, and welcome to Great Times Behind the Wines. This show takes you inside the operations at a family-owned winery, Hazlitt 1852 Vineyards, located in New York State's Finger Lakes wine region. It also explores the profound importance of a wine region's community culture. It's aimed to be fun and informative of all wine knowledge levels, from those just discovering a love of wine to industry experts. I'm your host, Shannon Hazlitt Hartz. As always, you'll occasionally be hearing from the true star of this podcast, my orange tabby cat, Hoover, who is quite like the mascot of Hazlitt's best-selling wine, Red Cat. And you'll get a creature in this show as well, my new rescue puppy, Luna. Well, I could talk about my pets all day, and I have to mention that Hazlitt is a major supporter of its local humane society, which you can learn more about in the show notes. This show is more about wine, after all. Like a dog is known as man and woman's best friend, there's a grape brawl. Like a dog is known as man and woman's best friend, there's a grape that can be seen as the perfect companion to the climate and other natural elements of the Finger Lakes region, Riesling. Riesling has become one of the most popular vinifera grapes in the Finger Lakes, meaning it is a varietal with European origin. It's believed that the grape dates back to cultivated in Germany, where it is likely native to the country's Rhine Valley. So how did this varietal, which produces a versatile and refreshing white wine, end up being so successful in a place as far away from its origins as the Finger Lakes? And what could be next for its evolution in the Finger Lakes? And why does Hazlitt now have four Rieslings made in three styles? Who are two guests, Samaye Paul Brady and Michael Reedy, Hazlitt's vinifera winemaker. Paul is a prominent supporter of New York Wine and host of the podcast, A Northern Wine Odyssey. He's also a contributor to The Cork Report, a publication that produces a northern wine odyssey and that explores and recognizes the unique places and people of North America's the unique places and people of North America's distinctive wine regions. Michael is among the first cohort to graduate from Cornell University's Enology and Viticulture program. Enology is a science that deals with wine and winemaking. Let's dive into my interview with Paul and Michael. The interview was conducted via Zoom since Paul lives in the Hudson Valley. I conducted via Zoom since Paul lives in the Hudson Valley. I thought it would be great to get his outside perspective on what really makes Finger Lakes Riesling stand out. Michael and Paul, it's so great to have you both on this show. Could you please start by just describing your background in the world of wine? Sure. I got started, I I was privileged and lucky as a as a young person to kind of grow up in a very uh, French American household, my, my, my dad was just very interested in France as a culture and in, in the language and studied abroad there when he was young. And so we were, um, there were many vacations, uh, you know, any, any time that was off and where we went, uh, we even spent some time living there as a family. So uh, came up kind of drinking French wine, like with, with my family. So I thought, I enjoyed it and I love food and pretty early on I thought maybe even I had an okay palate. Um, and so as I just became more and more interested in so as I just became more and more interested in it, start reading books, things like that, um, I eventually found my way into the restaurant industry uh, in New York City where I did worked as a, as a server and a manager and sommelier for about 10 years, always with sort of a dedication to regional uh, local wines to to, to sort of further explore that that interest. Uh, and, and that led me eventually to working with the New York Wine and Grape Foundation as a brand ambassador in, in marketing, and which led me to where I am today, which is in the Hudson Valley, working on opening up my own uh, urban winery and retail space in Beacon New uh, urban winery and retail space in Beacon, New York. Thanks, Paul. Now, Michael, can you please describe your background as well? I actually, I grew up in a family. My father worked for, in the brewing industry for the major brewers when I, since I've been a kid. So uh, as long as I can remember, he worked for Miller uh, and then for Anheuser-Busch. And, you know, I, I was always involved in science and that was definitely my, my really enjoy that aspect of things. And I was kind of, you know, went to college and I was going to be a doctor, but I forgot that I you know, needed to go to class. And do things like that. So I, uh, it didn't work out the first come around with with uh, with schooling. So I was kind of just you know floating around trying to figure out what I was going to do. And my father went off on a trip to you know the craft brewery explosion that's taken all over the country. And it, it wasn't like that you know 15, 20 years ago. So he came back with a T-shirt from a, a craft brewery, and I had this epiphany moment where I was like, well, I could do that. I could I could make beer, and there was a product at the end. Like I had enjoyed the science. 
and I was really getting into it. So I liked at the end, like I had enjoyed the science and I was really getting into it. So I had this idea that I would, you know, go out to California and I'd go to Davis and learn how to make beer out there, which is, you know, it's one of the big places for fermentation sciences. And then I am like, well, I got to move out there. I got to set up my residency, all this other kind of stuff. So I heard about Cornell doing a, a program. So I was like, well, I'll piggyback on that. And then just by going to Cornell, and then I took a part-time job at Lucas Vineyards on Cuga Lake uh, to, you know, supplement my income. Uh, and then I really just decided that I, I loved the area. And it was a little more mystique to wine. And it was a little more fun. I enjoyed it. And I wanted to stay in the area. So industry, and, you know, I from my last day was uh, a Tuesday at Cornell, my last test. And I started work uh, on Friday, on the Friday after that. Cool. Yeah, we're definitely fortunate to have you. <laughs> and yeah, Paul, thank you so much for describing your background as well. It's really an honor to have you on the show, um, to have both of you. But I just figured out, uh, since you're uh, new to the show, just jump into the questions with you, Paul. First, can you just describe how uh, you and Michael met? I was thinking about this, trying to pinpoint the, the date. I, I believe it was 2014 at, uh, at a New York wines tasting, like a walk around tasting in New York City. And I remember tasting the Hazlitt wines, which at the time I was unfamiliar with. And, and afterwards, reaching out to my friend, Chris Matthewson, who was at the time a winemaker for Bellwether uh, on Cayuga Lake and saying, I, I remember just asking about the wines from Hazlitt and saying, hey, I, I tasted some. I thought they were pretty good. In particular, I think there was a Pinot Noir. In particular, I think there was a Pinot Noir. Michael, which I, I probably would have been from the 2012 vintage that I remember tasting and liking. And, and, and Chris getting back to me saying, yeah, Hazlitt's a, it's a sizable winery. And yeah, definitely there are been different winemakers making some, uh, some, some really good things, which I think at that taste, all of your wines, Michael. So, so then fast forward a few years later, uh, when I was working for the New York Wine and Grape Foundation, and, and that's where we became sort of formally reacquainted. Awesome. Very cool. Well, yeah. Well, thanks for describing that. And could you also just describe how you first discovered um, the Finger Lakes wine region in general? So I moved to New York in 2008 from Michigan, where I grew up. And I grew up very close to the border of Canada. And my family, which was not so uncommon, had a, a, a cottage in Canada. So over the years, I spent a, a lot of time either with my family or with friends uh, on the Canadian side. Uh, of my family or with friends uh, on the Canadian side uh, of the border. And uh, actually, I, I believe the first Riesling that I ever had was a Canadian Riesling from Ontario. And I became friendly with uh, the owner of this really great sort of gastro pub in, in Bayfield, Ontario. And he had been a sommelier in Toronto and he had worked in the, in the wine industry in Niagara as well. And started inter introducing me to the wines of Ontario, Canada, which uh, I, I just immediately thought were good. And I was blown away, had no idea there was a wine region there. And again, at that time, I think it would have been, there was a wine region there. And again, at that time, I think it would have been very French. And when he found out that I was moving to New York, he said right away, oh, well, you need to try New York wines, particularly from the Finger Lakes. So. I was looking for New York wines right away when I moved to New York City and fewer of in the wine shops back then in, in New York City. But I was, I was looking for them and interested right away because I most definitely trusted uh, my friends in Canada. If they were saying that these wines were good, then I knew it, that they would be good. Now to jump into the topic of this podcast, Paul, can you please describe pair to Rieslings you had in Canada or you've had in other parts of the U.S.? So I, I am a believer in terroir. I do think Riesling is, a, in particular, a, a, an excellent grape to display what, what we have come to think of as terroir, which is essentially a sense of place. And I think Riesling's a, a really tough place. And I think Riesling's a, a really fine way to talk about that, especially here in this little pocket of, of Northeastern North America, where we have a region like the Finger Lakes, and you go a little bit north and a little bit west. To on a few hours to Ontario, Canada, where there's another fine region for Riesling, and then you go to the pocket of Michigan, and there's another excellent vinifera grape growing region there. Again, very very special for Riesling. These regions certainly we could all be fooled in a blind tasting. I I, I I don't know that we could do it ten out of ten times or anything, 
But uh, I do think that, you know, we would have a shot to a couple times. Uh, New York Riesling, this is a Ontario Riesling. Uh, I do think that the wines, in, especially when we're talking about pretty extreme cold climates like these, it is uh, uh, fun and and I do think possible to to taste the differences between the Riesling. So it's just one of those grapes that I've been taught differences between the Riesling. So it's just one of those grapes that I've been taught uh, to to understand as uh, being such that they they really do show where they're from. Why do you think Riesling um, in the Finger Lakes in particular has you know really become so popular? Well, I think that the Finger Lakes being attached. I think that the Finger Lakes being attached to New York City in in some respects has has helped that because as as the New York City wine trade became interested in Riesling sort of as a, you know, in, in the very forefront of our mind, um, back around 2008, 2009, 2010, um, in, during which the trade was really embracing Riesling from, from all over the world. And uh, there were certain smart wine directors who recognized the quality coming from places like the Finger Lake. They did those wines in their programs, you know, right next to those wines from Germany, from Alsace, from Austria, et cetera. And I think that that little push around the 2010s there, that, 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 was, that was really the time when I think that, that Riesling got a kick and then it hasn't gone away. It has made got a kick and then it hasn't gone away. It has maintained its identity as a, a grape and a wine that the trade respects as, with as much pedigree as something like white burgundy or Loire Valley Chenin Blanc. And whether or not Riesling ever becomes fully embraced by the, or not Riesling ever becomes fully embraced by the, the consumer wine world at large, I don't know if that, that will happen, but the trade you know, will continue to push that boulder up the hill um, be, because it, it's just one of those, one of those grapes, one of those wines that, that we love to drink with food and that we love to sort of, one of those wines that, that we love to drink with food and that we love to sort of just uh, explore the, the subtle nuances of. Sometimes that, that equates to maybe just too much inside baseball, but, but you know, the, we in the trade, we love to talk to one another and, and, and we love to uh, just continue also just doing the most important part, which is enjoying drinking these wines. So I think that Riesling will always have a place on, uh, you know, the, uh, the Mount Rushmore of white wine grapes in the trade. And, you know, we'll keep pushing the message and uh, hopefully the consumer wine world at large will, will get on board. Here. Can you please describe some of the key things listeners should know? I mean, for me, the, the only thing you really need to know is uh, in the 50s, Dr. Konstantin Frank came over from Eastern Europe. He was, I believe originally was from Europe, Ukraine. And he was working in Georgia at the time. And then the fifties, he came over and after a period of time, after a period of time, got himself up to the Finger Lakes and realized that we could grow grapes. And he, he had, had uh, exposure doing this in cool climates, the cold climates in the winter time in Eastern Europe. So he pushed it and, you know, we, they've been trying to grow that kind of grape around here for hundreds of years since the Europeans came over, uh, or hundreds of years since the Europeans came over. Um, so he finally proved that we could be doing this and, you know, he started the winery in the 1960s. So, you know, for me, that's, that's the big thing. Cornell's existence, especially on the grape side and the agricultural side is, has been, has been a huge boon to the industry in, in growing up. And, and then when, when Cornell started the viticulture program, the knowledge program, uh, in the late two thousands, uh, that was a, that was a big thing. So now we're, you know, we're training people. FLCC has got a program. So you're seeing people are being trained in the area to make wine uh, in the region, which we really, we didn't have before that. So I think those are the, you know, the big things is somebody was brave enough to, you know, all the European varietals. So there's Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. So, you know, that, that's kind of what happened. Now, Paul, can you please describe the reputation of Finger Lakes Riesling outside of the Finger Lakes region and a particular style of Riesling that might be popular right now? Sure. So just like anywhere in, in, in the world of wine, growers and, and those who, who produce the wines, styles change, preferences change. This doesn't happen just in any one place. It typically happens uh, in concert in, in different regions. So right now, there most definitely is an appreciation 
for dry refillings. Um, so in each of those locations that we talked about, whether it's in each of those locations that we talked about, whether it's Germany or Ontario or Australia or or the Finger Lakes, there seems to be right now this interest and push for bone dry rieflings, and, and the public does seem interested and, and, and coming on board for the ride. So I think style ride. So I think stylistically, all these different places are showcasing their their dry rieflings right now in a pretty loud way. Um, after that, in terms of how they differentiate, uh, that's a really fun uh, topic to explore. And I, I think that when I taste the Finger Lake world regions, but uh, they, they can be helpful comparisons, certainly for, for consumers. So I do think there are some similarities between the Finger Lakes Riesling and Rieslings coming from the Rheingau and the Mosul in Germany in particular. That's where I find the most similarity. Of course, uh, all, all those regions are, are very much their own place, um, but those regions are, are very much their own place. Um, but I do get more similarity uh, from those German parts as opposed to Austrian Riesling or Alsace Riesling, Alsace, which is just kind of a, uh, an island unto itself, uh, certainly. Um, yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I think a big part of it is... Um, you know, Germany and we both have, you know, Germany and we both have continental climates. So the majority of the air we get is, you know, it's, it's coming across vast bases of land. Um, and then typically what it's going to result in is we're going to have, you know, these warm days and cool nights. So that's a big thing for us around the Finger Lakes is, you know, the maintaining of the acidity is, uh, around the Finger Lakes is, you know, the maintaining of the acidity is, um, as the vine matures, the berry matures, you're constantly losing acidity when the temperature remains above 50 degrees. So when we have these nice cool nights when it's comfortable to sleep in the Finger Lakes and it's in like the, you know, 60s, high 50s, you're maintaining that acidity that in other regions drop off more quickly. So, and that's a big thing. And that's, that actually helps us to maintain that acidity so we can let that fruit sit out there and mature, which is, which is really nice. Uh, I would, you know, he's, he's speaking of the city, the one thing I would say uh, differentiates from different places of the world is the uh, the Germans Rieslings have this, which I adore. That this tends to have this smoky characteristic and almost like uh, like a matchstick kind of thing that we don't really see in the Finger Lakes, and I I absolutely love it. And that has to do with um, them doing some more lees aging than we typically do. So I I'm kind of playing with that a bit, um, but that's something that I. I wouldn't mind seeing a little more in the finger. I can smell that and I can almost automatically be like, yep, that's a German reason. And I just know that, but that's just something for some reason that just, it, it's the first thing I smell in the wine and I'm very excited about it when I, when I smell that in a German reason. Now, Paul, could you please touch on your preferred style of Riesling? It's funny because I actually, I prefer drinking Rieslings with a little bit. I find that for me, that that delicious factor hits right in anywhere between five and 20 grams. And I will also speak for many of my colleagues in the in the wine trade in New York City, we all really kind of like those off dry styles. So, you know, no one needs to stop stop making those and no one needs to be no one needs to be so afraid of a little bit of residual sugar, whether you're a consumer discovering recently for the first time or not. A little bit of sugar is can really, really make the wine balanced and delicious. And again, I would go so far as to say that that touch of off dryness is is kind of what the New York City trade rallied around stylistically uh, in terms of a lot of the different producers that you would find on wine list. I'm with you, Paul. I also like a little bit of residual sugar in my Riesling. And for those who also like this, thankfully, we have a couple different options at Hazlitt, which Michael will describe. But first, Michael, you've mentioned in previous podcasts that tasting wine is subjective, meaning that what I taste and what you taste may be different, but still correct. However, since Riesling is so distinct and recognizable on the palate, could you share some key characteristics we can expect when tasting a Riesling? So if I'm thinking off the top of my head, three, like, three or four, maybe five major descriptors, lime, apple, peach, apricot, like three or four, maybe five major descriptors, lime, apple, peach, apricot, and slate. So those are the big ones. But then, you know, there's all these nuances, pineapple, um, you know, nashi pear, which most people know is the Asian brown pear, which is, I really like. So, and I think it's a lot of things you, you get flavors that are reminiscent of, you know, Asian brown pear. So I will pick up that flavor or at least my brain thinks it's that flavor. So that's a big thing. Uh, and then another thing that in, in Riesling, you'll get honey and honeysuckle, 
uh, are big ones. And then is, you know, we say uh, petrol notes as, as the wine ages, it kind of, you get, you know, fresh beach ball. Like as soon as you take it out of the, the package when you were vein, um, and it, it has that smell and it's, those are the big flavors, I think really, especially for the, you know, the Finger Lakes reason um, that, that typically are, are really prominent. You see a lot of those, those particular descriptors in, in tasting notes, you know, across the region. Now, Paul. There's in, in tasting notes, you know, across the region. Now, Paul, can you please describe some of your favorite foods to pair with Riesling? Well, Riesling goes with just about anything. Um, it's, you can go to a steak restaurant and be the only person in the restaurant with a bottle of Riesling on your table. And I think you'll be the smartest person in that restaurant with a bottle of Riesling on your table. And I think you'll be the smartest person in that restaurant. Um, I mean, the acidity makes it so versatile. Um, and, and, you know, for, for me, even when you add that little bit of residual sugar, that even more so just enhances whatever it is that you're eating. I pretty much put hot sauce on, I like spice. And again, Riesling and, and other aromatic white wine grapes that, that grow in New York really well, like Diversemeaner, uh, Muscat, things like that are, are really, really excellent uh, with food that, that have spice and are just structured wines, things like um, and 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 I'm kind of like, I, I realize now I'm talking about the, the all sauce grapes, right, Michael? Um, those, I mean, I, I feel like those those are grapes that you don't have to be shy with phenolic tannin, and, and that again just sort of structurally um, brings out all, all all the best parts about drinking wine and eating food together. And same with Riesling. You've mentioned in your uh, wonderful podcast, The Northern Wine Odyssey, um, that restaurants in New York State um, will sometimes not feature, um, you know, New York State wines um, like Riesling that are of excellent quality. Can we describe, you know, why that might be, why they might have more, you know, old world or California wines and what maybe can change so that, um, you know, more, um, you know, more restaurants can feature uh, wines from the state? Well, you know, to, to, to get the best answer for a question like that, you would really want to take a good hard look at, at the data. And there are publications out there that, that make that possible to do. So, so for anyone who's really interested in that, I do think that, that looking, at data, looking at data, but you know, it, if, if you think about it in, in simple terms like this, like I, I, was, I, I once asked a, one of the editors from one of the big wine publications, what are the top five most Googled grapes? And what they told me, the answer were Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Grigio, Cabernet Sauvignon and Pinot Noir. So, um, you know, Pinot Grigio, and most of those grapes, with the exception of Chardonnay, you know, we have a little bit of that planted here in, in New York and throughout the East Coast. But um, for the most part, those really dominant grape varieties thrive in different kinds of climates and, and tend to just take over the wine list it, and, and tend to just take over the wine list. It, it almost always comes back to economics. So because those very popular grapes grow slightly better in, in different conditions in different places in the world, economically it tends to, tends to make more sense for, for restaurants who, who may not be, or for restaurants who, who may not be showcasing their, their beverage programs in, in a big way to, to rely on those wines for their bottom line. So I, I really can't give anybody any, any grief for that, you know, we all need to remain open and remain in business. But um, if anything that the remain in business, but um, if anything that the pandemic has shown us is that there is this wild interest in everything regional, everything local, and certainly that didn't just start with the pandemic, that goes back again, 10, 20, maybe even longer years. So I, I think that because of a whole bunch of just a tornado of, di of different reasons, we, we are seeing a shift toward wanting to drink more local, locally and to drink wines that are lower in alcohol, that are friendlier with food, and that's certainly where, where New York wines come into play. Um, again, we're talking about a cold climate, so and we're talking about a cold climate. So wherever we go in the world, whether it's northern France or, or parts of Germany, um, these sort of fine wines that are in the echelon of, uh, of recognition, that are doing well, that are receiving good score recognition, that are doing well, that are receiving good scores in magazines that sommeliers and the trade are talking about, those wines tend to be in the upwards of 
$20 or more on the retail shelf. At that price point, it's tough for certain restaurants to, to pour a wine like that by the glass. So I think really where where uh, medium plus tier, when you get into that $20 and over range, you put a New York wine that's $25 up with a, a wine from really anywhere else in the world at the same price. Maybe it's like a Chardonnay, a New York Chardonnay with a, with a, uh, a Chardonnay from Burgundy or something like that. That's really where our quality starts to be. Super local. You know, I've, I think, heard, you know, before that Riesling's grown and made around the different Finger Lakes can differ a little bit. Um, can you describe, you know, how Riesling grown on Seneca Lake might be a little bit different than a Riesling grown on some of the other uh, Finger Lakes? Sure. The yeah, the anecdote around here is it's I've you know it's I think it has to do more with the winemakers and the style for uh, to some degree and you know especially some of the more established wineries they have what's going on but Cayuga Lake which is you know the the easternmost of the big three between Canada or between Cuca and um, Seneca and Cayuga uh, I always notice it's a little it tends to be a little cooler be a little cooler over there up north of the you know because they're getting a little a little more of that head, um, the headland wind and water and air. They tend to be a little more lime and citrus and green apple. Um, so really, really, really fresh and pleasing style. Uh, Cuca Lake has real thin topsoil. So it has real thin topsoil. So they they get even more of that influence of you know the the bedrock and that slate character that we talk about. So you're getting more of that minerality in terms of aromatics and in mouthfeel. And then Seneca Lake is, you know, it's the it's the uh, the deepest. Uh, we've got the banana belt, which we store, especially on the, uh, you know, in that area, you know, the middle of the lake, you get more of that tropical fruit. So pineapple, you can get uh, apricots uh, as a pretty standard one. So, but I think really in the end, it's, you know, it's, it's the differences are there, they exist, but they're not necessarily as, you know, they're so vastly different because you definitely can get, very tropical grapes or very tropical wines from Cuca and you know limey and citrusy ones from Seneca Lake so it definitely it definitely does move around. For those who may not be familiar with the term banana belt it refers to the southeastern shore of Seneca Lake. This if familiar with the term banana belt it refers to the southeastern shore of Seneca Lake. This area tends to stay a bit warmer than other areas of the Finger Lakes because it features high west-facing slopes that take in more sunshine. Now, Michael, can you please describe the different styles of Riesling that Hazlitt offers that are grown on Seneca Lake? Sure. We, uh, so we do, we have, we have four Rieslings. There's Homestead and there's Dry Riesling, and they both fall into that dry category. But as Paul was discussing, they're, they're not bone dry. So uh, a good example of bone dry ones, like Australian Rieslings, tend to be bone dry and very linear and high alcohol, high acidity. And I, I, mean, I do enjoy those wines. They're, they're nice. So Homestead and Dry Riesling tend to be around anywhere from 0.4 to 0.7, depending on the year and the acidity that I need to balance out. So that would be that style. Uh, then we have the semi-dry style, which is, you know, we just call it Riesling now. We say even semi-dry because it skates, it skates this line between semi-dry and semi skates, it skates this line between semi-dry and semi-sweet, depending on the year and the IRF scale. So that's going to have, you know, three two and a half to three maybe percent residual sugar uh, balanced out by the acidity. And then the sweet Riesling, obviously more than that. Uh, I want to say that's around 5% residual sugar. So that'd be 50, 50 grams of sugar left over. Um, but really it's, they're so versatile is, you know, I like that puckery factor that the, the juiciness, uh, the mouth warning character of the, the, the off dry style. So you're looking at that 0.5 to 0.7 to, you know, 1% residual sugar. So, so that's one. And then you get residual sugar. So, so that's one. And then you get less of that puckeriness. It's a little more full mouth feel and, you know, like a, like fresh fruit, but still a little bit of uh, tang to it in that, that middle style, that semi dry to semi sweet style. And then the sweet obviously is, you know, really ripe fruit. The acidity is still there, holding up, acidity's still there, holding up the structure, making sure the wine doesn't come across as flabby or round or flat. Um, but you know, it's it's still there. But again, that's the nice thing about Riesling is there's there's a nice acidity to it, and it that really just helps frame all these different styles that we can make and gives it, you know, the very the versatility that it is. It's the most versatile uh, grape there is. Uh, you can make any style from, you know, a bone dry white wine 
uh, through dessert wines, sparkling wines. There's a there's a wine there is a uh, form of wine they call uh, orange wines, which is red or white wines fermented on skins, as just like you would ferment a you get a lot more character and tannin and mouthfeel and texture. Uh, so you can do that. I mean, basically the only thing you can't do is make a red wine with Riesling. Now, Paul, I like to ask as many new guests on the podcast as I can this question. What would you say is your favorite wine of all time? And don't worry, it's not a trick question. You don't have to say Riesling. Have to say Riesling. I mean, I, I, I never don't have a bottle of Riesling around. There's almost always a bottle of Riesling open in my fridge that I, that I will drink over a few days. Um, but... If I'm really, really, really being honest, <laughs> the the wine that excited me the most um, in in, um, in in our northeastern climate here back when I was just starting to taste these wines was, was Gamay from Ontario. So then when I moved to New York, I started looking for Gamay in New York, and there's there was not a lot of it. And, and we know now that there is a little bit in the Finger Lakes. There's a little bit in the Hudson Valley. I don't know if it was being made so well in Ontario, Canada, I just thought for a number of years, why isn't there more of it in New York? Why aren't more wineries or grape growers planting it? And there's a complicated reason for that, but um, some fun news, there are more plantings that are going in. So I do think we'll see, so I do think we'll see a little bit more uh, Gamay Noir in the future in New York state. And I'd be really surprised if they weren't trying to grow some down on Long Island. I know there is some in the Hudson Valley. I don't know about the Niagara Escarpment, uh, but I do know that more plantings are popping up in the Finger Lakes uh, of Gamay Noir and just uh, of Gamay Noir and just that style of wine that Gamay makes, that light, fresh, uh, you know, red wine that you can put a chill on it. There are many other red grapes in New York that we can work with to stylistically make a wine just like that in the meantime. And I think that we'll continue to do that uh, to make that, we'll continue to do that uh, to make light, refreshing red wines that are food friendly with Cab Franc, with all sorts of different red hybrid grapes. And yeah, Gamay, I think we're going to see a push for that. Oh, awesome. Thanks for sharing that, Paul. I've never had Gamay Noir, but now I'm excited to try it. Now, anything else you'd like to share about Riesling in general? I'll just share one more. And I, and I think that this speaks to the, to the quality of Riesling that you're able to get for the, for the price. And I was talking to a well-known wine writer, Jamie Good, and we were talking about Riesling and sort of some of the challenges of marketing Riesling. And he put it sort of succinctly, which is, look, when you go to and you stand on top of one of these steep vineyards and photos do not do it justice. You, you have to go. I mean, it's like if you've ever been snowboarding or skiing out west, I mean, it, these vineyards, it's like staring down a double box. It is heroic viticulture and you're looking at this this vine and you're looking at this this vineyard and the, so much if not all of the work has to be done by hand so much labor so much passion and love that go into these vineyards and then when like the, the wine is bottled the riesling is like 20 bucks so we're talking like the greatest rieslings in the world talking like the greatest rieslings in the world if you're a riesling drinker you're really pretty much the luckiest wine drinker in the world I think that Riesling is probably for a long time will, will remain the, the grape that people think of in terms of sort of the upper echelon of, of New York wines. Uh, again, it, there's always a, quite a spotlight that shines on, on, on restaurants and the trade there, the influential trade there. And when they think about New York wines, the first thing that they think about is, is still Finger Lakes Riesling. So you, uh, we in New York, you know, again, that this geographical attachment of the Finger Lakes to New York City, even though it's five hours, all Finger Lakes wineries producing Riesling. So we have this sort of built-in cheerleader, which is the New York City trade. And, and it, I think that's uh, something that we, we should all uh, not take for granted and, and try to, uh, to make great use of that. But, uh, you know, at the same time, I don't think that we need to, to time, I don't think that we need to, to uh, get tunnel vision, and, and we should not forget about the other grapes that are uh, of it, that are around and are making some absolutely stunning wines from uh, in, in New York State in the Finger Lakes. We hear a lot these days about Cabernet Franc and um, Cabernet Franc, and um, you know there there are some other red grapes that are 
have, have had a name and, and maybe aren't grown with as much acreage, but still make some some incredible wines that that will impress people and will create um, a, a, an even um, a, a, an even better sense of of how great uh, the state is for producing wine. So uh, I don't think we should ignore other grapes. I think Riesling is going to always be a major player, perhaps the major player, but um, we should really take advantage of of, uh, of everything, of all the tools that we have to work with that I think a lot of other regions uh, should be jealous of. That's our show for today. We hope you know a little more about what makes Riesling made in the Finger Lakes and other comparable parts of the world so remarkable. Thank you so much to our guests today, Michael and Paul, for talking about Riesling's success in the Finger Lakes. It was an honor to have both of them on the show and Paul for talking about Riesling's success in the Finger Lakes. It was an honor to have both of them on the show. And a big shout out to our director of marketing, Stephanie Jarvis, for her awesome editing help, in addition to musician Derek Streibig for the custom music. Last but most importantly, thank you, dear listener, for spending your valuable time with us. We hope you come back to learn more about the behind the scenes stories and information about the world of a family owned winery in the wonderful Finger Lakes wine country and please feel free to comment and rate this show. It's always great to get feedback. Luna and Hoover would love to know what you thought of their contributions as well. You can check it in Naples, New York by checking out hazlet1852.com. Until then, take care.